You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 330. Welcome to part 6, which is the final podcast in the Channel Island Way series, sponsored by visitguernsey.com and based upon the guide The Channel Island Way, published in 2011 by Coast Media. The book links together all the coastal walks around the islands of Alderney, Guernsey, Herm, Jersey and Sark to create a continual 110-mile route. We were invited by Visit Guernsey to walk sections of the guide and produce a series of podcasts about the journey, the islands and some of the people we met en route. You join us now on Guernsey at Les Vaugras campsite where we discovered one evening that the owners, John and Peggy Lenay, had been evacuees during the Second World War, sent off as young children with a single suitcase and separated at a very tender age from their loved ones and their childhood home. Living in this house 60 years this year, up to the age of 10... I lived next door down the road where I was born and uh, because of the war we were youngsters evacuated to England uh, where we stayed for five years. The family moved over there except for father who stayed next door during the German occupation and uh, we were five kids and mum and stayed in different parts of the north of England, Cheshire, Lancashire, Wales, Derbyshire. Oh, so you were split up then during the war, were you? All split up, all different places. Yeah. And I had an identical twin brother. We stayed together for a year and then I moved to one school, uh, a local Guernsey school, and he went to another one. And how was that during your childhood to, to do that during the occupation? How did it feel sort of from a family point of view? Well, it was an experience. Uh, I don't think we worried too, too much about the family aspect of it because it was just an adventure at that time. And uh, occasionally we only saw each other as a family two or three times during the war when we got together. But uh, most of the time uh, we stayed in our own corners and I was with the family. So I was very fortunate after a one year I lived with a, a very good family in Oldham and uh, stayed there for the four years. And I assume when the family got back together again after the war then it was a sort of a, 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 sort of a party atmosphere, was it? Uh, Yes and no. <laughs> well, having brothers similar ages, you see, uh, we were playing football and cricket and all these things, whereas we hadn't had it with the family. I played these different uh, games, etc., away, usually against the cemetery gates or something like that. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it was quite different coming back together. And uh, it seemed as almost as if we hadn't missed. Some people had great difficulty settling down again but uh, uh, we just continued we just well, my father always used to put it I've lost five years of my life because that was our formative years from mm. 10 to 15. Mm. Mm. And was it the same for you Peggy? No no <laughs> totally different my father died in 39 and we were just living a normal life you know back in our home and we evacuated my sister and my mother went with the rail school we went to Wigan my grandmother and grandfather and my mother's brother and sister and their partners evacuated and they finished up in Coventry because there was work. So after two weeks in Wigan, but at the same time as Junt's school, the schools went to Cheshire and we went down to Coventry. And um, just after the Blitz, we rented the house next door and we were a complete family. My grandmother did the cooking, my sister and I went to school, and the others went to work. So it was just a completely different story to John's. Uh, did you, was it the same sort of age? Was it sort of oh, ten, yes, ten years? yes, yes, yeah. And so did you feel that you were missing out anything at all by being away from home? Well, no, or? no, because we went, I went to the same school as my sister, a girl's, well now, it would be a grammar school, mm -hmm. and in 45... My sister started training college, so my mother in Coventry was earning good money, so we stayed there till 47, and on her first term at work, well, no, her last term at training college, we came to Guernsey, and actually she got a job at, at our old school in Guernsey, along with John's sister, 
Right. But we'd finished her te- teacher training. Did you feel that the, the whole experience, the pair of you, that it actually took you away from, obviously, a small island? Did it actually develop your skills and no, experiences? It, it was just part of life. Yeah. I mean, you took it for granted during the war. Everybody was doing something different. Mm. And then sort of after the war, my grandparents came back in the October and their house was exactly as they left it, but we'd lost our home. In, in what way? Physically, it destroyed or...? Well, or... no, all the furniture had vanished. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know, sort of the, uh, my mother was in rent and um, all our furniture vanished and goods, you know, and all the knick-knacks you have mm. in a home. Mm. There was nothing left and that was it. But we all took it as life. It was very rare for anybody in those early war years then to, to go to England. And so it was quite an experience. We were, we'd heard the rumour that we were going to Canada, which would have been very nice. Anyhow, we went to England, to the north of England, and uh, it widened our experience of life, if you like, and all the different things. See, the experience for us was seeing trains, double-decker buses, black and white cows, sheep, and sheep yeah. uh, all sorts of things like that that we didn't see local. Well, sheep you could see locally if you knew where to go and look. <laughs> but uh, most of the things were all new and quite exciting for us, you know. And, uh, so do you think there's a, there was a generation then at that time that when they came back after the war brought some new way of thinking with them? Uh, certainly. Yeah, I, I think... A lot of people, you know, their experiences in different parts of the country. And people are still telling of their experiences during the war years. And everybody had a story to tell, whether they were in Guernsey, whether they were in England or anywhere else, even prison camps, they have a story to tell about that time, uh, which is, well, we find it very interesting, having been involved. Mm. But, um, no, it's good. It's good. So did the family then... Develops go into growing when they came back, uh, or how did that all sort of yeah, come about? Well, most most people, as you're aware, were growers. My father was a grower, and uh, the family had been for generations and farmers. So it just continued with the growing business. And uh, after a year at school in Ger- back in Guernsey, uh, my twin brother and I went into growing. We did worked for uh, for dad, with Dad for about a year or two, and then we went on our own, growing outside tomatoes, bulbs, potatoes, and that sort of thing, just to make a a bit of a a bob, if you like. Mm. In that what, was was it commercially? Was it supplying a local market, or were you sort of selling further afield at that stage? Uh, well, we sold for. We always exported flowers and that sort of thing, and tomatoes, and tomatoes. So uh, that was where the market was, and it. it those early years after the war was quite beneficial for for people and the growing was was the business really to get into finance industry and those things hadn't come yet mm. so you looked to do what the family had done for generations and that was that the same for you as well peggy no, no. my grandparents were growers right and after the war we sort of settled with them and then my mother built a house about 10 minutes away from my grandparents and she went to work in town and then I was working in town, but I met you at the youth club, eh? mm. and we sort of got married, and that was it. So you were, was it, am I right in thinking, 21 when you got married, did you say? 21, yeah, yeah. 21. 22. 21. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to, to you both on that score, certainly. So what, when, when did the, the growing then change into to camping? How did that come about? Well, in 78, 76 or 78, was it? In the North Sea. Yeah, 78, I think, when we had the energy crisis at that Mm. time, the price of oil got very prohibitive. And uh, for a year or two, we tried growing cold in the greenhouses because we used to produce tomatoes in February at that Mm. time uh, with heat. But we couldn't afford to pay the price of fuel as anybody. Nobody else could. What finished the industry was when the oil sea gas came and the Dutch had cheap fuel. They had the North Sea gas that was cheap but we had to pay for the oil which was very dear top whack yeah. and they took over the english market really yeah, yeah that's that's quite so yeah so so when did the, the the growing activity decline then and change into to camping well when it hit, hit the the bottom really was 19, i think it was 1978 and then we started to think uh, what we're going to do and we decided that uh, We'll utilise our land and start camping, which we... I was well-versed in camping, but I was in the scout movement and have been training men and boys for years in uh, scout craft and camping in particular. 
It was slow growing the first year, but by the second year we were having to live off it. Was the growing had then had really finished, mm. and so we had to uh, rely entirely on that. So we built it up gradually from that stage onwards. And have you seen a, a great change in the type of people you call campers over the last yes. thirty-three years? Yes, a lot. Of, really, yeah. now the people who come camping are the ones who enjoy camping, mm -hmm. and they're. Uh, more easy going. I mean, the last month, the boats were upside down because they were broken and the campers were arriving late. The weather wasn't all that good and some of them had awful rough journeys, but they never complained. When we first started, if that had happened, they would have been in uproar about it. Eh? Mm -hmm. But I think campers must be true campers of easy going. You know, so uh, have you found that out? Well, they're much more easy going now than years before. I suppose they, 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 didn't, they didn't have an option beforehand. No. That was the only holiday they'd have. They're camping now because they enjoy the outdoor life mm. and the atmosphere of the camping. The facilities you've got here are lovely. Lovely, I mean, what looks Thank simple you. but very clean, very nice and exactly what people want. Do, do people sort of... That's my scouting experience, you see. <laughs> we knew what was the most important thing in a camp is good facility. Do people sort of expect or ask for any more than that? No, I don't think so. 70% is return visits. Mm. You know, so... Well, actually, how many tents or how many people are you licensed to have then? How does it work? Well, 150 sites, but we've added two fields since we had that permission. We've never asked for more, but we never get to 150. And we yeah. never count, do we? we well, seldom count too now. Busy to count. <laughs> Yeah. We never put the tents close together. Well, as that's an important see, part of it. People like the space, and don't they? up the other side of the shop, we, got we, two more fields. we put couples there with the smaller tents and no children. Right. And they like that, eh? Yeah, well, really, mainly Continental go up there, the backpackers, we always call them, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and some go up there and some down there, you know, if they want to shower, they all go up there. So it's well spread out and uh, they can all take in the flowers and the view. <laughs> Well, certainly I'd like to congratulate you on, uh, on the campsite. It is, it's a glorious display of colour today as, as we've, we've arrived, and everything is just perfect from our point of view. Well, it's bound to be perfect with the day like it is today. Uh, the weather is spot on. You know, we want this for the rest of the summer. And how many actual campsites are there on Guernsey itself? Because I'm a bit confused over that, because it's very, very restrictive, isn't it? It's very controlled. Yeah. There's only two campsites operating at the moment, Foké Valley and ourselves, but in the meantime, this is the best one around. It always has been the best. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to The Outdoor Station. Award-winning producers of podcasts to inform, inspire, entertain and encourage people to enjoy a healthy outdoors lifestyle. It was an early start this morning to, to catch the flight from Guernsey to Alderney uh, via Oringi Airlines. I think that's the correct way of pronouncing it. And we arrived here about about 8 o'clock. The heart of Alderney is, is, well, back to that comment that was made earlier on, every island has its own character. And certainly the heart of Alderney was not what we were expecting. I suppose we were comparing it in some ways to Sark. But because the roads are paved and cobblestoned, and there is much more of a heart to, to the village itself. It's quite a, quite a little hive of activity. Yeah, it's much more a sort of a, a village feel, a larger village feel. The, the houses, you know, it's Victorian terraced houses and the cobbled street, the main street. Um, very attractive. Certainly with all the facilities, a, a good handful of shops, uh, banks with cash points, which is obviously definitely one step above, above uh, Sark. 
uh, and very nicely appointed uh, hotel. We went for the hotel for breakfast, and that was uh, very nice overlooking the overlooking the bay. So we set out on the walk as per the um, Channel Island Way book, and we've now done probably about an eighth of it, where we've come round to the island called uh, Laser Tack or Garden Rocks, which is uh, where it is home to seven thousand breeding pairs of northern gannets, apparently. You can probably hear, if I just stay quiet for a second or two, you can hear a skylark in the background in the little valley where we're standing. And then literally a couple hundred metres away from me is this rock covered in gannets and gannet guano and standing out like a sore thumb. This is the noise they're making. It sounds like some sort of distant machinery, but it's a real clatter as you get closer. It's quite a surreal sight too, as you come round the corner to see the snow-white rock, because obviously with the, the white of the gannets and the white of the guano, it, it looks like something unreal. And then obviously they're all nesting on the, on the rock as well as swirling round it. It's quite eerie. The path itself is fairly easy going. There's a few uh, few occasional steep climbs and we're about to do one now out of this uh, this valley. But I'd say it's uh, akin to walking across you know, sort of common land, really. Yeah, it's, uh, the path's definitely less trodden. I think it's older new because you have to want to come here. I think it's a bit more difficult to get to. Yes, yes, yes. It's not so um, easy to follow underfoot. But it's still relatively clear and let's face it, you're on a small line and you can't really get lost. So, uh, oh, here's a plane going over, coming, taking off from Alderney Airport. Alderney International Airport. I see it's got all the uh, modern signs. As you can tell, they're all prop planes. There's, uh, there's nothing big and elaborate as jets here. Uh, we spoke to Joanna this morning from uh, Alderney Tourist Information who told us uh, quite a bit about the history, the local history uh, of, of Alderney and certainly um, we hope to catch up with her later on today uh, and to, uh, to fill us all in with a bit more detail. Uh, but already we've passed one of the concentration camps which uh, I never realised Alderney was home to and uh, from what she was saying this morning there were several of them. So um, we will learn a bit more history as we go along. So we're going to carry on now uh, along the route according to the book and uh, work our way a bit further around the island, heading, uh, heading north now to, to come back around to uh, the north side of St Anne, which is the sort of the, 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 the town, the village, the centre, the capital. And then we'll, uh, we'll fill you in a bit more a bit later on. About four and a half hours after we started, we are probably three quarters of the way around, perhaps slightly less. Uh, we've gone past Bray Bay and Fort Albert, and we're now sitting at Corblets Bay. We stopped for lunch at the harbour, uh, there's a little cafe there, had a snack, and we've taken our time walking, taking photographs, a bit of video, um, and just enjoying the scenery in the day. It has been superb walking. Fairly easy, gentle, undulating, uh, and very, very few people around. We've only used the poles once on one fairly steep ascent. Uh, we put them away on this section of the of the island. It's it's just lovely, easy walking. Lots of wildflowers and butterflies and birds. Um, fantastic bays. Nobody on the lovely sandy beaches. It's um, just glorious. Yes, the beaches could have come straight from the Caribbean. They're just white sand, very, very fine, um, and as Rose says, completely empty. Walk through the campsite. I don't know how many tents it'll take, but the campsite's just tucked behind the dunes, right beside the sea. Uh, a beautiful place for children. And we're, we're reliably informed there's over 50 miles of paths to, to walk on the island, although the circumnavigation we're doing is about 11.5 miles, and we'll probably do pretty well 90% of it only just because there's a convenient stopping and starting point. Uh, but certainly uh, plenty to, to look at, and certainly a, a lovely island if, if peace and tranquillity is your, is your thing. The uh, sea looks so inviting. We actually swam yesterday, didn't we? And it was, it was, the sea is so clear, 
Uh, apparently it's to do with the fact that most of the sand is from the granite rocks, so it's heavy, so the particles actually stay on the bottom because it, it's just turquoise, it's gorgeous. We've uh, spoken to a couple we met at the cafe at the harbour, um, who is a, a podcast fan, uh, coincidentally, and they're here for two weeks with their dogs, uh, and they seem to have plenty of things to do, photography and a bit of fishing, and then saying how much they enjoy the tranquility of the place. So we're going to have a rest now for five minutes or so, and then we'll pop on our little day packs. Rose has got the little Go Light VO24. Thank you. And I've got the Race Elite 25 Innovate, which contains everything we need. Supposedly there was going to be a thunderstorm today, but it, which it hasn't happened just yet. So we're just carrying some uh, some basic clothes, and we will soon get back into St Anne's, where we'll meet up with Joanna again and hopefully have a coffee and find out a little bit more about the history. It's the fortifications of the island which have, have come as quite a shock, only because every turning every corner there is either victorian or german defenses and if you've got to look where you're going because it's very easy to to step into um, trenches gun batteries various uh, observation holes access points uh, the amount of concrete that's on this this island is uh, defending the island is uh, very impressive uh, but also quite quite frightening so it must have been quite a uh, an important military point uh, obviously during World War Two and before. Any time, any place, anywhere. This is the Outdoor Station. A million listeners worldwide can't be wrong. It's all about the great outdoors. We completed the circumnavigation around Alderney in a very leisurely five hours, stopping on many occasions to admire the view, explore a few of the seemingly endless German fortifications, walk barefoot on the glorious sandy beaches, watch the wildlife and enjoy refreshments whenever we came across them. At the end of the day, we met up with Joanna Parmentier once again, who is the PR and marketing manager for Alderney. And I was curious to know what type of visitor gets the most from such a unique place. Um, certainly those who appreciate lifestyle. Um, Alderney is very relaxed and easygoing, and I think it's a great escape for people. Special interest visitors, those with a particular interest who want to come here to do something particularly like fishing. We have great fishing here. Um, those who, who appreciate history and heritage, um, and wildlife. We have some fantastic wildlife. Also young affluent families. Are you busy all year round? Because presumably the weather's fairly kind to you here. The season's mostly from April to September. The busiest months are um, June, July and August. Um, September is a really busy uh, month for events. We have golf competitions, half marathons, um, air races and um, the old annual hill climb. The, um, the, the visits that you get, presumably from mainland Guernsey, uh, do you get a lot of people that sort of visit for a day or do they stay for a short while? From Guernsey, um, they vary from day trippers to people staying for longer as part of a two-centre holiday. Otherwise, we get a lot of people who fly directly from Southampton here and they'll stay for a longer period of time and they're only coming to Alderney. We spoke to somebody down at the harbour today that specifically came here and they've come for two weeks and they're, they're staying down at the campsite. Uh, and they were really looking forward to, to literally switching off and slowing down. Uh, are they, would they be a typical family visitor? Absolutely. Yeah, those people who really want to, to, to get away from it, really want a relaxing and peaceful time. You know, there's, 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 no, there's no traffic here, there's no massive queues, everything's within easy walking distance. Um, most people are very friendly and it's just a really relaxing experience for people. The wildlife is obviously one of the main attractions here. Tell me a bit more about that. Um, Oldney is quite big on seabirds in particular. Um, we've got two gannet trees with 7,000 pairs of gannets between them. Um, one of them is arguably one of those most easiest viewed gannet trees in um, Europe, and they're northern gannets. Uh, we've got breeding puffins, 200 pairs, um, grey Atlantic seals, and um, blonde hedgehogs which, um, as far as I'm aware, I don't know of any other breeding populations of them. From experience today, we've heard the gannets from, from the shore, but uh, I presume the, there's a boat trip or whatever that gets, gets you closer. There is, there's a boat trip, and it takes you around the island, but um, on, on its way it takes you to see the seals. Um, you go past Baru, which is where the puffins are breeding. There's also storm petrels, cormorants and chags and all sorts of other um, seabirds. 
Uh, you visit both of the Gannet trees and then you take a tour around the rest of the island taking in all the Victorian forts but from um, the seascape as opposed to land and they're very different. That was one thing that struck us today as, as we've been round is just how fortified the, the island has been over the years and, and obviously there's two types of era that the fortifications were built. Can you give us a bit more information on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was um, there, there were the Rome, there were the Romans were here, and they had a, um, um, a harbour at Longy, and then we've had um, the Victorians. They had thirteen forts that they built, and Queen Victoria wanted to house the um, or home the British fleet here, so they brought our massive um, sea wall called the, known as the Breakwater, um, and it was going to have another arm, but they lent, ran out of money. Um, and then the most significant second period was um, during the Second World War when Alderney was um, completely evacuated, apart from eight people who stayed, and um, totally occupied by the German forces. Two questions there. What happened to the eight people that stayed? They were still here after the war, as far as, um, as, far as I'm aware. Right. Um, one of them was a farmer, and he refused to leave. Um, so they just stayed and lived amongst the Germans. But I think they were kept very separate from um, a lot of things that were going on, because there were three um, forced labour camps here. So there were a lot of um, prisoners of war and a lot of things that went on. I noticed there were some pillars from one of the labour camps. Uh, are they documented anywhere? They are, yes. Um, the pillars still exist on the island in all three places and um, they, are, they are documented in um, our literature and also in, um, in the museum with leaflets talking about the Victorian era and the German occupation. German occupation yeah. The Germans certainly dug themselves in well, didn't they? They did. I mean, one thing they certainly left behind was plenty of concrete. It's everywhere. There's not very far that you can walk in Oldney without stumbling across or into, you know, upon a bunker. Um, Most of them are obviously underground, but there is one in particular known as the Odeon, because it used to look like an old Odeon cinema, um, that's prominent and it's quite quite a significant landmark. The town itself is quite sweet and cobbled stoned and it certainly seems to be the centre of all the activities, unlike Sark, which is sort of dotted around and spread around the island. All the roads lead to St Anne's. Yes, I mean, St Anne's is the main, the main town. It's just a lit- the, literally the one street. But most of the shops and everything that you need is there. Um, the other hub is at the harbour, starting to um, have a lot more activity there as well because obviously a lot of the visiting yachtsmen come in and so they need servicing and don't necessarily want to take the walk up the hill. But, um, yeah, St Anne's is, is very pretty. And we've got um, our church, which is known as the Cathedral of the Channel Islands. The, there's a, a rail link or some rail tra- uh, tracks down by the, the harbour there. Is that still running? Yes, we've got the only running um, railway in the Channel Islands. It actually has um, some carriages from the northern line on there, which is pulled by our, um, by our train. And um, it takes visitors backwards and forwards along the line, which takes you on a scenic Scenic, scenic route along the coast and that runs on the weekends by volunteers and it was you it was originally put in place by the um, victorians to quarry stone to build the breakwater tell me about the island generally what sort of population do you have uh, normally and what does it, it what does it expand to and i'm curious to know what it's like to live here um it's well the island itself is one mile by three and it's seven miles square it's got about two thousand population um there's there's a number of houses that are owned by second homeowners. So in the summer and at, um, you know Christmas and Easter, then it's busier here. The busiest time of year is Alderney Week, which is a week long festival, um, and the population near near enough doubles during that week. All the hotels, campsites full, and um, it's it's really a week for the family. And there's lots and lots going on every single day. Um, living here, it's it's a great place to live. Actually, it's um, it's fantastic in the summer. It's a little bit um, harder in the winter, obviously, but I think it is anywhere. Um, but we've got good links to the UK and we've got good links to Guernsey, so it's, it's never too difficult to, to, to get off for a few days. But no, it's a nice place to live. As we've been walking around, we've seen various stones, which we understand Andy Goldsworth has been responsible for. Yes, that's correct. He came um, a year or so ago and he built the stones. There's 11 of them in total. Um, and then he brought them out in April and put them into place. And the idea is um, there's 11 all in different areas that he's chosen in particular. And each one of them has something inside. So I think some of them have got seeds, some of them have got gloves. Um, they're all things that he's found um, around the coastline, so things off of the beaches. And the idea is um, he's put them in different places to see how they're going to erode and shape, be shaped by nature, basically, which he thought was significant for Alderney. And has it attracted any interest? There's certainly been a lot of interest. I think he's very popular in America, so there's been interest there, and, and also he's a quite a big following in the UK. 
Well, they've only been into place in April and we know that we've had people visiting as a result of them, um, but we're hoping that there's going to be a lot more. On that note, how easy is it to get here? It's very easy, actually. I mean, you can travel direct from, you can fly direct from Southampton and that's serviced very well by the train. So it's literally, you get off at the airport over the footbridge and you're in the airport and it's, it's not a busy airport, so it's quite quick. Um, there's also, you can fly via Guernsey from either with or Rini that fly from Manchester or East Midlands um, and a number of other national um, airports or with Flybe from Birmingham and Exeter and other places. Um, otherwise, there is a ferry, but it only goes from France, from Dillette, and um, that goes a couple of times a month and that brings our French visitors to us. Yeah, I mean, proportionally, how many French visitors to UK visitors do you get? We get 70% um, UK visitors, and then the rest would be French, um, and we also get some Dutch as well. Some of the beaches we've seen today are absolutely stunning. You would think they could be found in the Caribbean, they've been towed across. That's true. I mean, I've been travelling, and um, I've failed or have struggled to find beaches as good as ours. I've found a few, but they are stunning there. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're small in size, so they're not massive stretches of, um, of uh, sand, but they're white, um, sandy beaches with beautiful clear water. A little bit cold, but stunning to look at. And, um, and there's plenty of them as well. And what's great is they just don't get crowded in the summer. So you really, you know, you're not fighting for somewhere to put your towel. And um, there, there's beaches for all sorts. You can surf here. Um, there's some beaches with fantastic rock pooling. Um, and then beaches that are just great for swimming, and then others for sunbathing because they're very well sheltered, and no, no matter whatever the wind direction is. And I noticed one of the nicest beaches right next door to the campsite. Yes, absolutely. Our campsite is literally a stone's throw from the beach. You literally just hop over the sand dunes and there you are. So an early morning swim takes about 15 minutes and then you can be back in ready for a shower. No, it's a fantastic little campsite, it really is, and people love staying there. We get some great feedback about there at the location of our campsite. There's also another range of, um, quite an extensive range of accommodation. We have a number of small hotels, um, guest houses, and quite an extensive range of self-catering in, um, scattered all over the island. So there's plenty of choice. On returning from Alderney uh, on our short little flight in yesterday in a very, very small plane, which was extremely exciting... It's a time for reflection, really, um, and just recognising just what a treasure the, the Channel Islands are, and in particular, Herm, Sark and, and Alderney. There's a certain timelessness and fortitude about the islands which makes them very, very unique and something that needs to be celebrated, I think, and maintained for as long as possible. There's a ruggedness to them. Uh, the landscape is rich and varied, the walking from a walker's point of view is, is uh, not difficult, but there's plenty there to, to interest people, whether it's wildlife or nature or just general peace and quiet. Around every corner there is some element to remind you too of the, the rich history that has been in these islands from sort of Neolithic right through to you know, the German occupation and, and more currently. So I think... There really is lots to uh, keep you entertained and, and interested in these islands. But above all, I think what, what will remain with me is just how beautiful they are. Certainly, there is a timeless beauty to them and an elegance and a pace of life, which is also uh, good to be treasured as well. There's a slowness, a grace to them, which is something very pleasing when you come away from, from mainland UK. It's certainly been an, an interesting trip, an enjoyable trip and a very informative trip. The Channel Islands generally is something where that I've always wanted to visit and Sark in particular for some reason has been ingrained in my mind as a, as a place to visit and I would certainly would recommend uh, all of the islands without hesitation. Sadly on this particular trip we don't have time to include Jersey although that is in fact in the Channel Island Way book but it's our last day today and this afternoon we have one last adventure which is to do a little bit of sea kayaking. So we look forward to, to sharing that with you a bit later on. We packed our belongings once again into our little jam packs and returned to Petit Bow Bay to meet up with Anthony Ford Parker, owner of Outdoor Guernsey. The weather was just perfect for spending time by the sea. 
patchy warm sunshine, a slight breeze, rolling white clouds beneath a deep blue sky, as Anthony set us up with sea kayaks for a paddle around the headland. Well, thanks very much for taking us out today. It's been an enjoyable experience, short and sweet, but it's extremely interesting seeing the, the, the coastline from a completely different viewpoint. Yeah, the, the very enjoyable conditions, not, not totally flat calm, which is, uh, is nice to get out in those kind of conditions with somebody that actually knows what they're doing, a nice, you know, nice paddle with other paddlers. That was very enjoyable for me too. Now, uh, you were just saying to Rose that sit-on kayaks have grown in interest uh, in recent years. Why is that? It's, it, we, were, we were just discussing why there's so many of those sit-on tops around, and I think it's, it's um, people have always been scared of, of being trapped inside a sit-in kayak. The general public, we that paddle know that they're actually comfy and, and, and mu- you can do much more with them, but sit-on kayaks have, have opened it up to a lot more people that don't want to be proper, trapped or feel that they're yeah, trapped, and, I guess, and, yeah. and, and, and proper paddlers as, as they look at it they're more re- recreational paddlers take the kids out in, in good conditions around around the coast and get to see some of this which is you know mm. I, I i i think that's a great thing you know that people can actually now have got the confidence with these sit on tops to actually get out and see it because it shouldn't be the domain of just the the elitist few mm. you know that that, mm. that are prepared to put on neoprene and, and <laughs> you know go and launch themselves into the surf it's it, there's a lot of stuff out there for everybody to see well, certainly as we, we set off today, I saw um, well, several sort of, I'd say, family groups, father and sons mm. coming in, and they looked like they had a great time. Yeah, they were having a great time, weren't they? Yeah, kids yeah. sat in the front of the boat, and dad's mum in the back of the boat, and it was difficult to tell who was having the most fun, really, <laughs> wasn't it? I suppose at least if kids dive off and they want to, they can get back into the sit-ons much easier than worrying about, uh, as you say, sit-ins. It's true. It, you know, that, that is the main thing, and, and whether it's you know, in people's heads or whatever, it is true that you can you can get back on these boats much much easier. Mm. So, yeah, the kids can just launch themselves in the, into the water, swim along and go and explore a cave and, you know, back on the boat afterwards, yeah. You've been doing this now for a few years and certainly looking on the back of the trailers here, we've got, what, 16-odd, uh, is it? 12, 12 boats here on the, on the back of the trailer. That's quite a collection. Uh, how has it changed over the years? Have people become more adventurous, do you think, seeing sort of the, the more uh, outdoor programmes on TV? Or has there been a particular um, uh, time that they've suddenly... There's been a, a vast amount of interest in actually paddling generally? For, from the paddling perspective, since we started using sit-on-tops and introducing people you know, on our, what we call our explorations, um, we've seen a, a big boom in, in the number of sit-on-tops on the water. Um, I, I, I never used to see other kayaks on the water unless I was with, it was with other paddlers I knew. Uh, everybody that had a kayak on their roof on the island, I knew. I waved to them as I went past. Now everybody's got a boat on, their, on the roof of their, their car. Um, so that's changed dramatically in the last two or three years. That's a massive change. Um, yeah, the, there are some good programmes around about getting out in the outdoors. I think people are, are, are confident to do that now as families, you know, from a, quite a young age. And uh, even 50, 60-year-olds nowadays seem to be a lot, a lot fitter and, and, you know, more up for getting involved with the outdoors than they used to be that's a good thing isn't it good mm. thing talk about confidence uh, i know you do co-steering as well and that's had a sudden um, growth hasn't it in the last 12 months or so yeah we were talking about this earlier weren't we the, the, the co-steering for us is 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 rapidly catching up with the, the kayaking um people were a bit wary at first because they didn't, didn't quite know what we were up to we just got, they thought we were just jumping off cliffs but um, the more people we've taken out, words got round that, that actually we're exploring a really quite, quite a fantastic environment out there. So it's not just about jumping off cliffs. It's, it's a lot of other things too. Perhaps for people who are listening to this and, and, and not very aware of what co-steering is, it, describe what a family group might go through if you took them out for an afternoon. OK, well, we, we get kitted up in wetsuits and boots and helmets and buoyancy aids. So it's, it's quite easy from there on. There's no other kit. There's no kayak or paddle or anything like that. It's just you and some protective gear. And we go traversing around the uh, coastline and, and, and exploring, basically, at sea level. Maybe sometimes just above it, sometimes maybe just a little bit below it, you know. But it's basically at sea level, exploring the coastline. Pools, caves, gullies, whatever. And who gets, what type of person gets the most from that? Type of person? Wow, well, they, they've all got a similar mindset. They're all up for having a go and... and, and 
and appreciating the outdoors and, and the whole experience. And there is a certain glint in their eye while they're doing it and a, and a certain recognition that they've done something particularly special when they come back and they, they, they keep coming back as well so mm. well that's a, that's a good thing i mean the the certainly the waters around the islands here and guernsey in particular are wonderfully clear and uh, obviously it has the same sort of tidal issues that uh, any island would have but it must make it an ideal uh, location for doing water sports generally but in particular kayaking well, the, with this huge tidal range, we've got um, you know ten meters, ten, meters, ten, meters, yeah. ten meter, thirty feet tidal range. It means that every time you go out, it's slightly different, and it changes really, really quickly. So to get the breadth of experience to really understand and know what's going on the whole time, you've got to spend a long, long time doing it. You know, which is gives people a lot of scope for variety. So, you know, the families that are going out, they're not doing the same thing every time. They're they're very unlikely to do the same thing every time. You know, variety, and, and with it being such a small island as well, you know, stacks of variety for people. The four coasts of the island, is, as it were, are quite different characters, aren't they? Um, I mean, you've got certainly the, we're on the south coast at the moment, and it's, it's very craggy, very rocky, but obviously around the north and around the, the west coast, it's more, it looks calmer, but you're saying it's more challenging paddling conditions. Yeah, the, you've got the views here on the south and the, and the east, on the west, you've you've got views of beaches, which is quite nice too, and 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 some lovely shallow areas where the tide goes out a long way, and you can see a lot of of sea life. We had one guy who just picked up a, a spider crab the other week, and just he just leant out of his kayak and picked it up, and it was a keeper as well. We we put it back, but it you know it was a big a big spider crab. But you see these sort of things wandering around all over the place, you know. Mm. And then on the north coast. It's those challenging conditions, real fast moving tides in between all the little islets and, and the overfalls. And, and so if you want some exciting paddling, you know, that's, that's, that's the place to head for. Well, certainly look at you. You're tanned, you're fit, you're healthy. You've got a smile on your face and not, and not a worried wrinkle, wrinkle. So it's a bit of a tough job, I think, all in all. Yeah, I've got a few wrinkles, eh? but they're not from worry. So uh, it's just old age now. But yeah, no, it's fantastic life, isn't it? And um, just... Who wouldn't want to be out there all the time if they could if they could do it? But for me, it's introducing people to it and seeing the growth in it is what I like about it. That's what I get take away from my job, is seeing people that I've taken out paddling or co-steering, and actually, I see them out independently on their own. You know, and that that's gratifying to me, because I I know how brilliant it is out there, and they and they now they know. Thanks to everyone involved in this, the final episode of the Channel Island Way series, and to the sponsor, visitguernsey.com. More information about the Channel Islands can, of course, be found on the website, should this series inspire you to try somewhere different for a long or short break. Our guide, The Channel Island Way, is published by Channel Island Map Specialists Coast Media and written by Blue Badge Guide Arthur Lamy. The book is available from Amazon.co.uk, priced at $9.95, and in visitor centres and book retailers throughout the islands. The Channel Islands certainly have much to offer the walker, and we really enjoyed the rich variety and character each island offers. Not just glorious views, secret coves, white sands, wildlife and fishing, but a more pleasurable, relaxed approach to life. No matter which of the islands you're lucky enough to visit, you can be sure that you don't have to go far to switch off and appreciate some of the treasures which go to make up this quiet, secret little corner of the UK. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear more from our extensive free library, please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. You can now follow The Outdoor Station on Facebook, where we chat about each programme we produce, answer questions and discuss future productions. Why not join us there? This podcast is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk.